OK. Hey, everybody. So uh, my name is Jeff Harrell. I work with PayPal. Uh, about last year, we talked or we announced that we were going node for most of our production stack. And since we've had a lot of companies reach out to us, and I want to know how we did it, how we adopted it, uh, how we convinced sort of the overlords of the company to make it work. Uh, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about sort of the, some of the issues we've run into and the NT patterns in this case that we actually experienced along the way and, uh, you know, hopefully encourage people to not do the same thing. So a little bit of context. We first went live uh, with Node in 2013, right? But, you know, it's been a year. Uh, it's been, I think, uh, I'm not even going to try to do math right now. It's been a year. Uh, we have, when we went live, we had one app that was live. It was our consumer-facing portal. We now have 35 apps that are live. And this is, these are major things. There are our home pages, <coughs> excuse me, our external pages, our uh, payment pages, onboarding pages, sign-up pages, et cetera. Um, pretty much at some point, all major parts of the site are actually running live on Node. Uh, and so we've had a large portion of our engineering developer teams go through the Node process. Uh, that said, most of them came from a Java or C++ background. And so we've also had to train 400 new JavaScript engineers. And it's worked out mostly well, actually. I would say most of them are pretty pleased with the move so far, which is great. However, they've all made awesome mistakes along the way. Uh, and when you have a large you know, portion of people going through and doing Node at the same time, you can't keep tabs on everyone. Uh, other little fun fact, just from a, a build standpoint, uh, per day we have about 500,000 NPM installs coming through our uh, internal servers. Uh, so that's just, you know, the quantity that we have being developed right now. Uh, so anyways, that said, that's the context. So uh, jumping into the anti-patterns themselves. <clears throat> and the first one, actually people have discussed a little bit today, it's don't bring in baggage from your previous stack with you. Um, it seems to be a common thing, be it from Rails or Java or ASP.NET, uh, whatever stack you have. In our case, it was Java. And when you drag a lot of people from one technology platform to another, it's inevitable that they effectively want to port and rebuild everything they have and the way they did it on their, uh, the new technology stack. So in this case, actually, I just have a couple of quotes that I had to deal with uh, over the last year that I, I swear came up like a dozen times each. Um, and the first one, I have a little bit of generic. It's, you know, no doesn't support X. It won't work for me. Uh, in our case, this was actually probably the funniest one because it had various flavors. And my favorite was, no, or, you know, does Node support Spring Webflow? <laughs> no. no. No, it doesn't, no. Well, if it doesn't support Webflow, we can't, build, we can't build our apps in that. This won't work. We have to use Java. Uh, and we had a couple teams that you know, were adamant around that at first. Um, and so you know, various different approaches were used with that. Uh, a lot of it was actually just sort of you know, educating teams like, hey, look, don't, you know, I know you, you built with Webflow originally, but you know, like break that mindset. Don't port. Actually learn JavaScript. Understand how to deal with it in JavaScript. Maybe some of the proper patterns, like maybe you used it as a crutch, maybe you didn't. Uh, today we have, I think, out of all the teams that wanted to specifically use Webflow, only one is using any sort of like flow task manager based uh, module that we created. The other ones have all actually just, you know, walked away from that holistically. Um, also, coming from a Java background, we had the greatest one where it was every single team that we picked up and started adopting Node. And, for the most part, they were, uh, in the beginning, at least serialized. So like one by one, we would adopt new teams. Every team would get up there and would be like stressing, like, how do I deal with, with node module version conflicts? Like, wh what's the way to do this in, 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 uh, in node? Like, I don't understand. And, and it was like, what, what do you mean? I don't understand what you're talking about. And, and they'd explain it, and you're like, oh, you're talking about Maven dependency. Yeah, we don't have Maven. Like, that's not an issue here. Like, you don't have to worry about what this, you know, what version this is using and what version you're using and if they conflict, like, doesn't usually happen. Uh, but it was interesting that every team got up there and really stressed that in the beginning. Uh, interesting from that perspective. Uh, and then the other one uh, was covered uh, earlier too, which was a lot of teams that were stressing over, you know, I can't let the app restart. Like, I have to do whatever it takes, capture all errors, like, prevent anything from the app ever crashing because it'll take too long to come back up. And, and then it was like, have you, Restarted your app in development. Yes, it takes a second. Okay, like wh what's the concern? Well, I don't know, good point. Um, <laughs> so these are a couple of our examples at least. Uh, the underlying theme is ultimately, you know, like leave your baggage behind. Uh, I have my little side quote, except if you're flying, like don't do that. Um, but leave your baggage behind, actually like learn the new stack. Uh, this was our biggest issue with getting traction up front 
Uh, and especially from a company when you're adopting it, you don't necessarily have a lot of great patterns with your existing apps for people to learn from. And so everyone goes and starts you know, trying things out how they knew how to do it with their previous stack. So leave your baggage behind. Uh, it's pattern number two uh, is monolithic applications, which always seems to come up. Um, and in our case, uh, PayPal's history was effectively, uh, if you've ever looked at our URLs, some of them are so old at this point, but we had like a massive C++ binary that we deployed that was like the world of PayPal. Uh, that was a decade ago. And then we moved over to Java and we fragmented our apps, but they were effectively, uh, as I like to refer to them as mini monolithic apps. So we would deploy an application, but it was like holistically its own application. They wrote all the code. 99% uh, of that code may have been duplicated over in this application. It doesn't matter. They're various different teams. Uh, <clears throat> and so actually leveraging uh, Node and NPM properly helps avoid this. And so one of the things we did early on was stand up our own NPM instance internally. And that helped out. We were able to deploy our infrastructure code, but actually encouraging teams then to use it was also a harder thing. Um, teams would go down and they would effectively embed most of their functionality in their app. Uh, and if I jump ahead a little bit, <laughs> there's, you know, if you think of like any typical PayPal app, there's things like uh, onboarding a user or adding a credit card or adding a bank, et cetera. Teams would effectively go build their application and build all of this in their application. Uh, and we saw this early on with a bunch of our apps as they ported to Node was they were, again, using the porting word, porting. And so they were taking their Java app and effectively redoing it over in Node, which made them not think about things like that. And so we really started encouraging teams to publish things as modules rather than actually embedding the functionality in their app. Uh, and this is just food for thought when building your apps. And actually, uh, as you adopt Node or as you move forward with Node, is, is make sure you actually are uh, leveraging NPM modules uh, and you know, following that philosophy of just having small modules that do one thing and making it easy. Um, key part on that last one is to also not overloading modules. Uh, as soon as we got teams to start making modules and building modularized apps, they then started making module and being like, I'm modularized, because their app would effectively depend on a single module that then had like everything in it. Uh, and so it was progress. You know, we got them to modularize, and then we now needed to push it a little bit more and get them to modularize the modules. Um, yeah, I like that. Uh, so anyways, uh, sort of the key part with that anti-pattern is uh, you know, build with many blocks, not with one. Um, playing with one block is never fun. Uh, so three, <laughs> this was also sort of the fun one. Um, like, has anyone Googled anything about JavaScript and then not put like Node in front of it? Uh, I remember actually there's a, I'm pointing back at Eric because I'm thinking of a conversation with him a long time ago where it was, like I was complaining about this facet of it and I was like, dude, just Google like searching an array or something, crap. And you know, I was like pulled it up on Google and like, look, the first result's jQuery. Uh, and so this was really early on when we started it, but it was sort of funny, like, you know, jQuery results dominate search engines. And so if you have a lot of team members that don't know much about uh, JavaScript or are learning it firsthand, uh, we, there was a node app or two that had jQuery in them, and they were using it to do iterations and things. And, and it was just like, what's going on? Why are you doing that? And then you ask them, they're like, oh, that, that makes sense. Well, I Googled it, and then, yeah, yeah, don't do that. Um, so, you know, a little bit of understanding, actually, like, uh, I think everyone in this room understands this for the larger point, but just let's understand JavaScript and actually how it works. Uh, let's understand that when we search for JavaScript, that results are for, obviously, the server and the client. This is the one uh, con, effectively, of having JavaScript span the server and client, is that, you know, if you have JavaScript on Node, that's one thing. If you have JavaScript in the browser, you pretty much play by IE's rules, in which case, you maybe don't have the best JavaScript. Um, but also, uh, in the sense of understanding JavaScript, like understand the latest JavaScript, understand where JavaScript is going, uh, and you know, maybe you leverage the modern things, maybe you don't, but at least understand them so that you know how to tap into them. Uh, so yeah, learn JavaScript before diving in. Uh, and just calling that out specifically, I think we had a fairly uh, sane training course that we were sending engineers through, but they would get really excited by this training course, and then they would immediately jump out of the training course and you know start knocking out their Node apps. Uh, and it was like, no, take a little bit of time, like play with it, like write an app, throw it away, please. Like don't publish your first app live. Maybe not a good idea. Uh, into pattern number four, uh, handling errors. And so in this case, I don't know. I thought it was appropriate that the dog flying through the air was an error, but. Um, 
errors are fun in JavaScript. Uh, and I know there's been a couple uh, issues we've run into so far. <laughs> and, you know, namely, first off, don't, uh, like when you pass an error, like pass an error, don't pass a string or a number or like false or something. Um, they've all been done. People probably, you know, even in this room done them. But actually pass an error object with, you know, a stack trace, messages, things like that. Make it useful to the person downstream that's collecting the error. Um, I have uh, throwing is for programmer errors. Uh, not in all senses, but you know, also uh, if you're coming from a language that you throw errors in all the time, like don't throw every error in JavaScript. Uh, this was a couple apps we had that went down this path uh, and, and fundamentally changed the way that they built the app uh, for better or worse. But whenever they ran into an error, they would just throw it and assume someone was catching it. Um, and that had its own issues that then we had to deal with because now that you're throwing all the errors, now you actually have to explicitly catch all the errors and deal with them in various ways. Uh, and it, it wasn't really playing with the async nature of how we were building our apps. Uh, and then in that sense, it goes back to the whole like, I can't let my app crash. So you, know, you can go back to the whole like, do you restart on uncaught exceptions or do you actually ignore them? Um, in our case, we're trying to urge teams to actually just let the app die and restart itself. Uh, yeah, different thoughts on that. So in a sense though, without dwelling on that too much, uh, you know, errors are hard, uh, but actually do make sure to read up on them. I know uh, the best explanation I've seen at this point has probably been like uh, the blog post joins had a while back, which talked about the various types of errors, how to deal with them. I know that was useful for passing around to our teams and getting them to understand uh, when to use things and when to not. <laughs> Five. Uh, I kid you not, we have something that maybe looks like this too. Um, so wrapping everything in promises. Uh, and this is not a promises are bad or promises are good. Just actually make sure you use promises correctly if you're going to use them and understand them. Uh, in our case, you know, it's use them for the right reasons. Uh, we have teams that are using promises. We have teams that are effectively overusing promises. Uh, and in one of those cases, it was, you know, if we're always throwing our errors, promises were an interesting way to deal with it. Uh, but it was a chicken and egg thing, effectively. Uh, or if we have this crazy waterfall scenario, uh, you know, promises are an easy way to actually collapse that and make that a little bit saner looking. Uh, again, chicken and egg scenario for the most part. Um, they weren't actually you could argue like tapping into the right parts of promises. They were just using them for a solve that they weren't doing something correctly to begin with anyways. <laughs> um, at the same time, uh, understand that if you're basing your app on promises and all of your various code that you're depending upon is now in promises, if other people then want to use that code, it makes for a little bit of a hairy scenario if they're not following that model too. And so, you know, ex uh, modules should expose callback interfaces at a minimum, let's say. Um, and this is something we've been doing uh, for the most part. All of our infrastructure code, all of our actual core code is running that way. Um, teams can then opt to use promises if they want to from there, uh, but we're not trying to force that upon them. Uh, and just a fun little fact at the end, uh, and we're still actually working this down a little bit, but uh, if you are using promises, you know, again, try not to overuse them, but also don't use them in, or let's say overuse them in hot code paths as well. I know we ran into problems with one of our apps where when, as we started profiling it, we started to get horrible results and horrible CPU time that was eaten up just in dealing with promises themselves. And in this specific case, it's a, let's say, over-promise example where it's, it's too much going on. Uh, but do co be conscientious of that. Obviously, there's more overhead invoked when using a promise versus just a vanilla callback. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, and then so for my deal with that, I have my own opinion, but it's a, like, use callbacks. Um, and so here's sort of an interesting one. Uh, this is uh, fun during development, is that you can use git URLs in your package JSON file. Uh, you can effectively cheat the system, if you will, and have a dependency that's in git. You can use tags, you can pull it in. Um, but inevitably, as you start getting down that path, you'll notice that you'll run into problems. Um, it's easy to get started, and then the problems get hairy as you go. And so part of that is that you know, Git URLs aren't leveraging fully Sember for the most part. So you can't effectively version things. You can tag them and then, you know, hopefully increment those tags uh, or, you know, publish new tags. But you'll, if you start, say, overwriting things, you'll get into problems where uh, the module gets cached locally and then someone's like, dude, I'm installing it. 
and I'm not getting the code you're telling me that I'm getting. And you know, everyone pulls their hair out for a while, and then you're like, oh, clean your cache. Like, maybe that's the problem. And then they do that, and next thing you know, it's working. Um, and so, you know, caching problems, unstable state, just from knowing what you're in. It's really sort of a, uh, a deal like publish to NPM, like take the time to set it up internally. Um, there's pretty documented solutions. We have Kappa that we're running. There's other enterprise versions of it. Uh, there are documentation on how to set it up yourself, quite frankly. Um, it's worthwhile to do it and just make sure you're actually using it properly. Um, yeah, I think that comment went. And then sort of my favorite. Uh, so sloppy async code. Uh, and there's been a bunch of people that have talked about various aspects of this, but you know, I think part of it is as you're learning uh, new programming techniques and new languages, uh, make sure to actually understand the best practices behind them too. Don't be that guy that you know creates that like callback waterfall chain that's like 20 levels deep. Um, they've all existed in some code, but if you do see them, like, you know, there are ways to solve them, like refactor them, make it better. Um, and so, you know, part of that's understanding the actual control flow patterns. And that could be with various modules, it could be with just with various coding practices that you use. Um, but again, you know, don't be that guy that does that. And so hoist your functions, uh, take them out, collapse it a little bit, don't do them in line. Um, you know, use promises appropriately for <laughs> scenarios like this. Uh, use the library async or various other control flow modules that'll allow you to deal with that. Um, but again, make sure that the async code you're writing is actually clean and, all, and understandable because as you get into a larger team, you're inevitably not gonna be the only one that's touching that code. Uh, or next month when you look at it, you're gonna be a different person touching that code and not understand what you wrote anyways. Uh, and then <laughs> down that pattern, or down that path uh, is, you know, if you're writing an async like function, like understand how it works. Don't under, don't think that it just like stops the code. And so the example I have is, you know, like callbacks with code out afterwards, but no return. And so this is like pulled people's hair out so many times uh, internally to our teams where it's like, oh cool, if true, do this callback. And then, you know, beneath it, the assumption is like, oh, if, if false. But in this case, like callback and, and fallback are both gonna actually execute and so inevitably you run into like weird race conditions or weird like symptomatic scenarios where you're like, I don't understand why this code isn't, this code is getting executed. It doesn't make sense. And it's just sort of understanding how the fact that it's async and it'll work and it's not necessarily moving it. Again, use good async patterns. Um, yeah. And then uh, number eight, uh, someone made a comment earlier about this, but. Uh, you know, having Node do everything. And this has also been a common pattern that we've noticed where our teams and various companies that I've talked to have all like, cool, how did you solve, you know, all these things with Node? And it's like, well, we didn't. Like, don't necessarily think about that. And so a couple of scenarios that always come up, like uh, SSL termination, like we're not doing it with Node. Most people aren't. Most people, if you look at like their flow diagrams, if they're SSL or if they're just a site in general, like they probably have some sort of reverse proxy in front of a node. They probably have Nginx or something in front of it. Um, in our case, SSL termination happens at sort of many points along the way, but it definitely isn't happening in node. Uh, at the long same line, like heavy encryption with node, uh, for various parts of our process, we have areas that are fall into categories like this, um, and they're not done in node either. Like doesn't, doesn't really need to be done in there. Could be done, may not be the best choice to be done. Um, and so understand those scenarios. Uh, and then sort of the, the tie-in with the Nginx, uh, there's various other ones I could put in here, but uh, this one always comes up a lot. We have, uh, inevitably, there's an email that comes up or a conversation comes up where they're like, well, cool, how are you guys, uh, you know, like loading your certs into Node or like binding, you know, to this port or doing gzip or getting performance out of X, Y, and Z? And it's like, yeah, we're, we're not. Like, don't, like if your Node process starts up, like just start it up on something else. Um, don't start it up on AD and just have it like the front app uh, especially from like a, you know, how you're gonna create multiple apps perspective. Uh, but actually understand that there are other pieces uh, of the toolbox that you can use. And so ultimately like understand how those are, look at what companies are doing, things like that. Uh, use the right tool when it makes sense. And nine. Uh, and so this is sort of a fun one. Um, and I swear I almost could tell you I took this picture on the way down, but I didn't. I saw this and I was like, um, so, like, ignoring the Node ecosystem, and if you ask me, I think the part of the reason, you know, Node was fun and sexy when we adopted it, 
Uh, and it was like, cool, it's JavaScript. You can use it on the server, you can use it on the client, it's great. Uh, but the best part about Node since adopting it is literally the ecosystem of Node. It's the fact that I don't need to go write every single damn thing. I don't need to solve all these problems, or more importantly, I can actually reach out to the community on Twitter or in GitHub or in various scenarios, and the community generally responds back with a force. And so actually, uh, like, embrace the ecosystem. Uh, and this is sort of the, its own little anti-pattern. We've had uh, good and bad with this, I think. It, it's been hard to get our teams to understand that coming from a background where you know, there isn't as tight-knit of an ecosystem. And so actually getting those teams on board with that and understanding that there's different types of ecosystems. There's an internal ecosystem from amongst all the other Node developers that, and an external one. And the internal one effectively mimics uh, uh, you know, on an internal level the external ecosystem and so it's sort of like a collaborative, you know, before I go write something, let me go see if something else exists internally. If it doesn't exist internally, let me go see if it exists externally um, and, and, or how it was done. Um, and so in this case, you know, NPM has a wealth of pre-written code. Uh, that's an understatement, I think. You can probably at this point search for anything on NPM and it will be there, uh, including a t-shirt module. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, I think, uh, not just code-wise, but also information-wise, right? And so node security is a good example of, of example like this. Like, you know, you get updates from the community on what's uh, best practices, uh, in this case, security uh, scenarios. Um, it's worthwhile to be tapped into those and pay attention as much as you can. Uh, and I think this is obviously preaching to the choir because it's conferences like this that also portray that information and get that out there. Uh, but in itself, we need to make sure that our teams are actually thinking at this level too. Uh, and so from that perspective, it's, you know, embrace your new community. I do have a warning on here that the community may contain drama. Um, not that the new community has any drama, just uh, it, it could. Uh, and on that note, that's the ninth one. So thanks, and I don't know that I have time for QA, but uh, that's over <coughs> drinks later. Okay.